Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, January 18th, 2011 City Council Informational Meeting. Call the meeting to order. Uh, we'll start off with our City Council staff report with Deborah A. Owen, City Clerk, Chief of Council Operations. Thank you and good afternoon, Sioux Falls City Council. Um, as many of you know on the council, we try to list those areas on our notice of public meetings where there may be a quorum present. Uh, there's that big Sioux River Greenway that has, that's meeting every Wednesday at 11. Can you let us know if you plan to attend that for quorum reasons? Otherwise, I think we kind of keep track of that, those other items that are available. But that one we, we really didn't know. So, And then moving on, uh, as you know, the Board of, Equaliza Board of Equalization meets in March. It's the third week in March. Mm. Those are lengthy meetings, and uh, that's the 21st to the 25th. Uh, the uh, county would like to do a 10 to 15 minute orientation for our new council members and so we're kind of hoping that maybe you would be open to doing that in an informational sometime down the road or perhaps following that be, be as you are here and, and as a matter of convenience for you but they would like to meet with you before that um, time to kind of work through how that works and uh, and then also on that note as we get our updates from our South Dakota Municipal League uh, in terms of uh, who makes up that board of uh, that local board of equalization, there will be a proposal by the municipal league to change out the uh, or hopefully uh, to um, change out the dynamics of, of who staffs that in terms of elected officials. Right now, it's about six city elected officials and one uh, school board, and we either would like to have that be more of a majority of school board as other ones who receive majority of the property tax revenue, or even a 50-50 split. But we're also watching that, and so those emails were sent to you earlier from the league, and that's one issue that will be affected uh, should that be successful in Pier this year. On to tonight's seven o'clock agenda. There are a couple of things. Uh, of course, the second reading for the Board of Ethics ordinance that's been, uh, it was first heard at City Council in June 7th of 2010, and then it has been in the Public Services Committee for some time, and it's coming back to you in an amended form. So you'll need to um, approve that as amended and recommended by the Public Services Committee. There's some notes in your red notes about that. Uh, and I, I think Kenny Anderson, Jr. is the chair of the Public Services Committee. He uh, may choose to speak to all of those changes tonight, or I can if at his request. And then lastly, on item 47, there is, we just found out about this today, so our apologies, but we need to have some language change to that resolution. Uh, it is, it should state that, uh, the first whereas should state that this petition, uh, comes from the city planning office in the or, or the resolution out there says by the owners and so we'll need to have an amendment when you after you make a motion to approve this an amendment to change uh, by the owners to by the city planning office and that is all I have thank you any questions for Deborah okay so we have the uh, work session planned for the 24th uh, anybody here know of a problem they might have right away. I think the clerks worked through that to get all those worked out. So, Okay, in late March for the Board of Equalizations, I think I'll be gone. That, <laughs> that uh, I'm not sure where yet, but I'll be <coughs> scheduling that. Uh, all right, uh, any other questions for, for Deborah? Okay, uh, let's move on to our uh, uh, little report, a report from our Public Services Committee. Councilor Anderson. Uh, public services uh, met last Monday, January 10th. Um, one of the things that we moved forward on our agenda was the ethics uh, ordinance, and that is uh, being presented uh, to the city council tonight. Uh, some of the changes I think that uh, will assist the ethics committee in uh, being able to work a lot smoother uh, with the city attorney and the whole process, I think will work a lot smoother. Um, I also want to give the floor to either one of our committee members if they would like to also comment on any of the changes that were made. Uh, we worked very closely with the city attorney and the ethics committee uh, to make these changes, and I, I think that'll be a good thing for all. Okay, very uh, good. Also, we uh, <clears throat> took the uh, audit of the uh, 
police reimbursement fund. And we tabled that until the police department is done working with the pawn shops on the ordinance changes that they would like to see. And once that's uh, presented to the council, uh, the hope is that it will be transferred to the Public Services Committee to review those changes. Okay, very good. Any questions for Councilor Anderson? All right, thank you. City Council open discussion. Anybody have any uh, uh, Councilor Litz? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, observe uh, city government in action here recently. Uh, uh, you know, I've been interested in the Snowgate controversy. Uh, I've been on here for five years and did a little investigating back in the day. And, uh, uh, but uh, about a week ago, during one of our bigger snow events, I followed a snow uh, gate for about three miles. And uh, in the process, I stopped and talked with three people who were out shoveling. And uh, without exception, those three people enjoyed the lessening of the amount of snow that they had going across their driveways. And uh, I, too, uh, I've got property on Grange and 15th Street. On my Grange Avenue, I still get the, the big cement snow row. And then on 15th Street, the 60-foot wide apron that I have, it's considerably less. And so, you know, I, I too, have uh, enjoyed the benefit of having that. But after following the snow plow for a little bit, I, I just wanted to report to uh, you folks and the public that, uh, you know, the snow gate actually increases the width of the blade on the snow plow. And there were a couple of instances where they had cars parked on both sides with tickets on it, I might add. Uh, but it was very difficult for the, the, the operator to get the snow plow through there. Uh, you know, it took a little bit of extra time. And, uh, and in one case, somebody had to come out of their house and move their car. Uh, the other thing that I did notice was the, there's the, a valve on there for the hydraulics. The hydraulics, I think, are made for a warmer weather situation than ours, and when they get cold, they get a little jumpy, but there's actually a, a kind of a relief valve or a, a control valve put on there. We've retrofitted with them. I noticed that because it wasn't the same uh, type of material as the hydraulic hoses that are on there. Also, when I was inspecting the snow gate itself, uh, the, it, it is my observation that I don't think these snow gates are made for a heavier snow, a heavier snow with chunks of ice, because when, when the snow gate loaded up in the corner with all the snow, uh, some of the snow came actually over the top and was hitting the hydraulic hoses. And the, uh, the snow gate that I inspected was loose, and the driver that I talked to uh, said he had to tighten them every now and then. Now, I, I believe that we could probably retrofit it with some kind of a shield and overcome that problem, but I think it's an inherent design uh, flaw that's in that, in that piece of equipment. Uh, the other thing that, that I noticed that was of a concern to me as the snowplow went along, if you had a big apron or, you know, if there was a, a large amount of snow there, it would collect in the corner, and then when the snow gate lifted up, it tried to push it up over there. Well, some of the snow actually came over the top, and as a result of that, uh, it, it fell back on the street by about another foot. And so, and, and the, the driver was kind of ambivalent about it. I mean, he was just kind of reporting what's going on. Uh, but it's my observation also that I think we're going to have to go back on those streets at some point, one or two points, and make another pass here to widen those streets up to make them to make them the width that they would be if we ran across them with a normal blade. Now, uh, these are just some observations. I'm not pro or against that snow gate. You know, I know people like them, uh, but they are some things that uh, we're going to have to consider on down the road, and it is my belief that these are going to show up on the reports that we get at the end of the year when we consider these. So, thank you. Now we know what Bob Litz does with his spare time. <laughs> Follows city plays around. Any other open discussion items? Councilor Erpenbach. If I can just add to that, I, I don't want to talk about snow gates, but I'd like to talk about those two cars that were ticketed on either side of the driveway. And I'd just like to ask the public to please move their cars, when they, especially if they've been ticketed. Get them out of the way. I mean, it's, it's causing problems for your neighbors. Those areas are not getting plowed properly. And we really need to, that's one of those things that is just about being a good neighbor, is to move your car out of the way when there's a snow alert. Get it onto a driveway. Get it onto a street that's not going to be plowed. But please do that for the rest of us. Otherwise, the street is just a mess. The plowing doesn't get done. And Mr. Cotter and I have had this conversation, but the towing is going to get a little more strict as well. We need to enforce that ticket and tow needs to happen. And so I'm encouraging those folks to get that, get the cars out of the way. Well, yeah, Mr. Chair, if I may, 
Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, Michelle, and I've given that some thought here too, because uh, if you look at the areas that are predominantly, uh, that have a lot of street parking in them, the older ends of town, the central part of town, the houses are smaller, the frontage out in the front, uh, the house is smaller, the driveways, everything is smaller. If you get out into the nicer neighborhoods, uh, most folks have off street parking. Uh, I, I would tell you that, you know, you're dealing with a, a more modest income. I noticed uh, the tickets were really heavy around Augustana and Sioux Falls College. We're talking about college students here with not a lot of money. One of which was my daughter, which I gave her the tickets since she made a, the point that she was paying my salary. Didn't want to argue with that. But, uh, you know, so as, as, as far as the towing goes, you know, I'm, I'm hoping, and, and in particular this last snow event, it, happened, it took three days, you know, to get done. And, uh, and perhaps, uh, uh, unless you're online with, uh, you know, the snow removal warnings that come across your computer, uh, uh, it's a little bit, it was a little bit difficult this last time to determine when you had to have your car off the street. And because I, you know, I, I have some property and then there were some other people who were asking me and I didn't know what to tell them except to go on to Channel 16 and maybe go online to uh, uh, SiouxFalls.org and try to find that information. And I understand that we do have a service that will alert you as to the snow. Uh, you know, the, which, which zones are getting plowed. But, uh, you know, the towing, yes, but uh, I, I guess I'd, I'd look for a little leniency depending on what the situation is. Like I say, if we have another three or four day snow event, it becomes confusing as to when the streets are going to be plowed and it's not fitting into the normal pattern. Uh, maybe some, some consideration should be given to that. But normally, yes, I would agree to you that there are people out there that take advantage of the situation, leave their car parked there. And right now, there's, you know, there's a big chunk of street that's not plowed in various parts because of that. So, yes, I, I hear what you're saying, but so. If I could just add to that, I've lived in the Central District more than 20 years at this point and have lived in some of those tiny houses with tiny lots, and I've watched the snow alert and known to move my car to the north-south street when the east-west is going to be plowed and then move it back after it's been plowed. Yes, you have to pay attention to the news and you have to pay attention to the website or whatever, but it is important for the rest of us then who are also sharing those streets that are getting narrower and narrower as it snows and we plow and it snows and we plow. It's important to just be to be courteous to each other, and that's all I'm asking for. Very good. Any other open discussion items? Anybody? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to our presentations. We'll start off with our sanitary sewer assessment report from uh, Mr. Howard Green. Good afternoon, City Council. Trent Lubers, uh, Water Reclamation Superintendent. Uh, thanks for hearing our presentation today. It's uh, been something that we've been looking forward to do. We promised you an update uh, last year when we had uh, um, uh, accumulated some of the information that we've been gathering with the assessment. Um, you're going to see a lot of information today. Um, what we'd like you to take away is that uh, we had a systematic process uh, uh, as we went through this assessment, um, that we've developed a list of projects and prioritized them. And uh, we've taken a look at um, what the rate impacts are going to be on our customers uh, in the future as we move forward with this plan. Um, on, the next, on the next slide, uh, <clears throat> I, I guess you can't do a project like this uh, without having a team. On August 4th, uh, we realized that the task before us was going to be fairly significant. And so we assembled a team of uh, uh, local experts to help us out, um, to give us a fresh set of eyes at the problem and quite frankly, just to accumulate the mountains of data that we were going to generate. Um, it wouldn't happen without leadership. Uh, the Director of Public Works, Mark Cotter, has been uh, a great supporter of this process, and he's, uh, he's, he's helped us along the way, uh, getting us what we need and, and getting us through the process. Mark Perry, the Principal Engineer for Sanitary Sewer, um, has worked tirelessly on this project. Bob Kappel, you're all aware of him, and Bob has uh, helped us through the environmental challenges that have existed uh, as we've gone through um, the DNR communications. Uh, Brad Vostad from Public Works Administration, the accountant there, has helped us with many of the financials. Um, my team, the water reclamation crew, has been on the cutting edge or the leading edge of uh, gathering all the information with the sewer televising, uh, with uh, monitoring and setting up the flow meters, and, and assisting the consultants in gathering the information that they need. And uh, it would not have happened without uh, the, the 17 members of the collections crew and their supervisor. Um, Don Horner uh, with Howard R. Green is a uh, a, a local expert. She's a, a recognized expert uh, in sanitary sewer. She's the assessment coordinator. Green is, is who helped us uh, pull all this together. Dan Graber from um, 
HDR Engineering is going to talk to you today about uh, one of uh, our key projects, the Central Main uh, Sewer. He's going to talk a little bit to you about hydraulic modeling. And uh, HDR and their group was um, key in the peer review process. As we developed our list of projects and as we went through, uh, we wanted another set of eyes to take a look at this. And uh, Dan and, and his team were instrumental with that. And then finally, Steve Burian will talk a little bit about uh, rate impacts uh, and, and uh, the projects and how they'll affect uh, the customers uh, with rate impact as we go forward. This slide uh, represents um, our major trunk line sewers throughout the city. And one of the things that we've communicated to you is that our infrastructure is aging. There's over 800 miles of uh, sanitary sewer system, collection system out uh, in uh, the city limits of Sioux Falls. And like, no other, or like, like every other city, we have aging infrastructure that we need to attend to. Um, this map is kind of divided into 10-year uh, uh, segments, uh, purple being the oldest pipe, older than 50 years. You can see um, in the core area of town that there's a, uh, a section of pipe that's purple. Um, you'll see a long um, line of red on there that uh, represents the central main. Uh, that pipe is 40 to 50 years old. And uh, there's orange sewer uh, up on the north end. That's the area where uh, we had the collapse last summer, <clears throat> and yellow and green. If we were lived in a perfect world, all our age in the sewer, would, everything on this map you'd see would be green. We'd love to have uh, uh, sewers that were 20 years old or younger. Um, given the new reality that we've <coughs> experienced last summer with the rate of corrosion that we're seeing, um, we're using age as a guide to evaluate the system, but it's not the only it's not the only factor that determines the necessity of repair in the system. Condition of the pipe, some, uh, some pipes uh, will corrode uh, at a more accelerated rate than other pipes. And, uh, Don Horner will be talking about that uh, as we move through. The next slide uh, is just uh, some key projects listed uh, <clears throat> in the capital plan. Uh, we actually plan in a planning window as we do master plans. We, uh, we plan for five years in the CIP and the CIP, CIP process that you're all familiar with, but beyond that, we look at a 10 to a 15 year window so that we know when things are coming up uh, and we do rate impacts and we calculate the cash that uh, is taken into consideration. We look at that out into the future. So what you see here is some key projects that were in the existing uh, capital plan that uh, um, are actually projects that will help us deal with uh, the, the issues that we saw in the sanitary sewer system this past summer. In the next five years, uh, we have a, um, another list of projects that uh, were identified and uh, some of those will be moved forward into the existing CIP, hopefully as we move forward through this process. I'm going to turn you over to Dawn Horner now, and she's going to talk about the documentation and the process uh, of the assessment and mitigation for the sanitary sewer system. Dawn is a regional, a regionally recognized local expert in, in or I'm or sorry, a regional expert in sanitary sewer. She's the lead consultant on this project. Um, she's been very instrumental in pulling all this information together. I know the last time we talked to you, we showed you, a, I think, a five-inch, three-ring deep um, binder of information that we've accumulated for the assessment. I have that here today if anybody wants to read through it. But uh, that uh, information has all been pulled together um, through Dawn's leadership and, and, and her lead on this project. As we go through these projects and um, you see the consultants and, and listen to what they have to say, uh, again, I want you to um, take away the fact that uh, we've had an organized and, and deliberate process as we've gone through this. We've developed a, a list of projects and identified them as a, a way to deal with uh, some of the infiltration or the uh, capacity problems that we've had in the system. And then we've taken a look at several rate options and how it's going to impact our customers uh, as we uh, go into the future. And I'll turn it over to Don. Thank you, Trent. Thank you, council members. I'm Dawn Horner, and I'm with Howard R. Green Company. And I've been working on the sewer assessment for the past five months, um, along with the sewer assessment team. Um, the city water staff, wastewater staff invited me here today to explain some of our efforts for the sewer assessment and mitigation. I plan to discuss some of the goals that we set up originally um, at the beginning of the project, some of the tools we use to assess the sewer, and then the maps showing the um, prioritized projects that we, we um, developed. I also am going to come back to the map you just saw showing the age of the sewer pipes and, and show you what our proposed projects are going to do to the age of the sewer pipes, how that map's going to change. 
After the emergencies this summer, the team developed three main goals, and there were five major assessment tools that we used to meet those goals. To evaluate the condition and capacity of the trunk sewers, we used closed circuit television cameras, field inspections, and hydraulic modeling. In addition, to identify sources of inflow and infiltration, we used the flow meters and sump pump inspections. Using the data collected this summer, along with previously collected data by the city, the team developed prioritized project lists with the main goals of eliminating trunk sewer failures, reducing inflow and infiltration, eliminating sanitary sewer overflows, and reducing sewer backups. Now before I move on, I just want to briefly explain inflow and infiltration. Inflow is defined as water entering the sewer from surface sources, such as directly connected sump pumps, roof drains, foundation drains, and leaking manhole covers. Infiltration is defined as groundwater entering the sewer through defective pipes, cracked manhole walls, leaking joints, and sewer service connections. Now I'm going to focus on the two main tools used by the team. First, the team wants to thank the council for taking action last September to accelerate the purchase of 20 flow meters. The flow meters were installed last October upstream of the Tuthill lift station to monitor flows at various locations. As you can see, the Tuthill lift station is shown on the right side of the image. And we're monitoring um, the flow along the entire Sioux River South Interceptor, which runs from the Tuthill lift station, follows the Big Sioux River south of I-229, crosses I-229, and just follows the Big Sioux River to the north. The flow meters were placed on the Sioux River South Interceptor and on every trunk sewer, major trunk sewer that was coming into that interceptor. The average flow from the, each flow meter was then compared to the actual water usage for each area. That would be the actual water usage used by homeowners and property owners. If the flow differed significantly, we can tell if there's infiltration or it, it's an indication of infiltration. I've included two flow meter graphs showing results from late December. The graphs are from the flow meter at Basin 07A, which Mark is pointing to now, and that's located near 57th Street and Western Avenue, and 07B, which is near Big Sioux River and 49th Street. Switch it over. So the results for the basin for 07A, um, the gallons per minute of flow is shown on the left side of the graph for the week following Christmas. The average flow of 1,880 gallons per minute is twice as high as the water usage that was noticed through billing. This is a major indication of inflow and infiltration in this area of pipe. The fact that the minimum flow is higher than the typical water used is also an indication of, of inflow and infiltration. On December 30th, it rained 0.38 inches, and on December 31st, it rained 0.23 inches, along with warmer temperatures. Um, the graph shows a significant spike in flow during that rainfall event, which also indicates inflow and infiltration. So this area has been a major priority for a lining project, and you'll see it in the list of projects. Um, and then also remember this location. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention it when we talk about television results. This graph shows a little different picture and is just upstream of the one we just looked at. But this shows the flow for Basin 07B. And as you can see, the average flow and the actual water usage for that basin is similar at about 420 gallons per minute. The flow also stayed consistent through de the December rain events. So for this basin, it's kind of been ruled out of any inflow and infiltration issues at this time. The second major assessment tool that we used was camera, a camera traveling through the sewer to generate a television report. We, we, um, the television reports are then reviewed by the team and we rank each, each pipe segment based on structural condition, liner condition, and joint condition. They're ranked from one to five and five is the worst. And please note these colors that are used on the chart above and those will be shown on the map on the next slide. But again, I wanted to note that sewers are expected to last 50 years, and especially with the um, pipe materials, non-corrosive pipe materials that the city of Sioux Falls has been using since the 1980s, 
A common misconception is because the pipe is old, it's the one in the worst condition. And, and that's not always the case. It's, it may be the pipe material and it may be the characteristics of the wastewater that are causing corrosion. So as I mentioned, here's a, a map showing the actual ratings for each of the pipe segments televised. Now this one only shows the structural conditions because after the emergency trunk sewer failure this summer, that was the critical concern, is what was the condition of the, of the pipe. Um, you can see the red is, is the stuff that was rated the worst. There's a few spots of orange um, located in a couple of those areas. And the next few, few slides will show you the projects that are, are already on the project list to get rid of those, those worst segments of pipe. They're being, projects are being proposed to, to alleviate those areas. Also, I want to point out the segment of pipe from Basin 07A. That, well, that was rated a three as far as structural condition, but as you can see from the flow meter charts, it was rated a five as far as the joint condition and inflow flowing into those joints, infiltration. So after the initial data was gathered using those assessment tools and we analyzed that, the team developed this list of projects. The list of projects was then separated into tier one and tier two. The table sh here shows the tier one projects and a total of $27.3 million. The, this list has been submitted to the South Dakota DENR as part of the order of compliance. The state is going to require that these projects be done by July 1st, 2012. And all of these projects are online to meet that deadline with all of them started in design except for one. I also want to point out here that mo all of the projects listed in white were projects that the city had previously identified and they were already in the capital improvements program. And that's shown and designated by their CIP number. The two blue projects were projects that came up as part of the emergency work this summer. This map was developed to show the tier one projects that are required and the tier two projects that are being proposed through 2025. The main tier one projects are shown in red. The Walnut Main trunk sewer project already complete and repaired the structural failure that we've all heard several things about. The central main interceptor replacement, segment five and six, is shown here and will increase the capacity downstream of the Tut Hill lift station and replace deteriorated, deteriorated aged reinforced concrete pipe. The Tomar Heights trunk sewer and drainage way improvements are shown and, it, and that will repair the exposed sewer pipe found in a drainage channel during field inspections this summer. And one other thing I'd like to note as far as the flow meter area shown in the yellow there, the flow meters that we purchased in September serve almost one quarter of the city and has been collecting very valuable information. The tier two projects are shown in orange. These include both mitigation projects but also include the planned projects that the city had um, for growth in the city through 2025. There are also several tier two mitigation projects proposed upstream of the Todd Hill lift station that will increase capacity, reduce inflow and infiltration, and help eliminate future sanitary sewer overflows at that lift station. To summarize the assessment, I have repeated the slide showing that the, the age of the sanitary trunk sewers. The tier one and tier two projects shown on the previous slide will replace several of these older pipes. So I wanna draw your attention to the red, the purple, and the orange and the next slide shows all the tier one and tier two projects switching over to green and being part of the sewers constructed or rehabilitated since 1990. And as you can see, a lot of the red and orange areas went away and that's mainly um, the reinforced concrete pipe that's seen the corrosion. The city will be in great shape after these projects are complete with the majority of the infrastructure being less than 35 years old. I have gone over the goals of the assessment and the tools that we use to assess the sewers um, and I've also shown you a list of the projects and what the, pro what the sewers will look like in the future. Dan Graber with HDR will now describe the hydraulic modeling used as part of the assessment 
and summarize the upcoming Central Maine project. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Don. Again, my name is Dan Graber with HDR, and I've been involved in a number of these sewer projects for some time. Um, one of the, the ongoing activities we've been, been doing over the last uh, several years is a comprehensive dynamic hydraulic sewer model. And Don was talking about the information that uh, we talk about inflow and infiltration. And so this sewer model takes uh, factors to uh, estimate uh, what the inflow rates are going to be, what the infiltration rates are going to be, and then along with population and uh, land use uh, predicts these, the uh, ac actual sewage uh, generation in each of the areas. That information and it is put into a computer model along with the pipe sizes uh, to predict what's going to happen in a particular rainfall event or in a particular dry or wet season. So what we, were, what we used the model to do as a result of some of the storm events was to see if we couldn't uh, replicate some of the uh, backflow situations or, or backup areas where we had extensive backups. And uh, the area along Pam Road, which is west of uh, Lincoln High School, there was a number of backups in there during the events and also around the 30th and Phillips areas. And by running the model and updating it with some of the information that Don talked about, we were able to replicate uh, what happened in the backups in those areas. So then what we can do with that model is then look at alternatives. We can add some relief pipes. Uh, one alternative we looked at is adding a relief pipe at 41st and Duluth across to connect into the Sioux River South to see what impact that has on the Pam Road area. So that, that ongoing work helps, um, helps the staff, helps the engineers to look at what are the best alternatives for looking at relief sewers or uh, providing additional capacity. The other um, important factor for accurate modeling is get, getting good flow metering. And as Don said, the, uh, the installation of the meters at the various location provides the model with much better information. Therefore, we can calibrate the model better, um, and that really is essential for providing good, accurate modeling information. So that uh, September um, pr procurement of those of meters and getting that information has really been helpful in updating the, model acti the modeling activities. Okay, we're going back. Uh, the, the red circled area is the area that we're we'll talking about next, the area of the central main. We're looking at the area then from basically the 11th Street Viaduct south towards the Tut Hill lift station. First project, we call it Segment 5. It runs from the 11th Street Viaduct all the way down to just uh, through Cherry Rock Park. This project was originally scheduled for 2012. We moved it up to this year. It's about 7,500 feet. The estimated project cost is $9.155 million. We have some project incentives. Uh, we're looking at um, having the contractor restore the project in phases. As soon as he completes the, the installation of the pipe in a segment of, say, approximately 2,000 feet, he'll have about 30 days to restore that area. Um, that would include putting the bike path in, uh, seating the park area, putting in the, the drainage facilities, and so on. We've incentivized that for him to earn an additional $1,000 a day uh, if he gets completed within 30 days. Another critical area is the Cherry Rock Park. Uh, Cherry Rock Park is a fairly high use area, a lot of picnicking, uh, volleyball going on there. Um, we do have to cross the entrance to Cherry Rock Park. Uh, we're going to uh, restrict him to five days to complete that entrance. During that five days, he has to maintain at least one-way traffic in there. We've also incentivized him uh, $1,000 a day to get that completed within the five days. The bid date we're planning on is February next month. Uh, we'd start construction the following month in, in March. And these are estimated completion dates where the, the Drake Springs Park area, uh, we'd anticipate that being completed around July the 1st. Uh, assuming he's starting at 11th Street Viaduct and working back from there. And with the, the entire project uh, operational, operational, that means the sewer pipe is, is running with sewage in it by uh, estimated October 1st with the final contract completion date of October 1st of, of this year. That would, he would have all the um, uh, restoration done, the bike trail complete, and so on. And again, this segment is from the 11th Street Viaduct down towards and through Cherry Rock Park. 
The next segment is what we call segment six. Uh, this was originally scheduled for 2013. Uh, this is about 8,500 feet from the end of segment five, Cherry Rock Park, crossing Interstate I-229, down through Rotary Park, uh, Paisley Park, and uh, crossing the river right by the Tuthill Lift Station. Estimated project cost there is 12 million, a little over $12 million. We have the same type of uh, incentives on this project for them to get the restoration completed in the areas that have been completed uh, within 30 days of, of getting the sewer up and operational. <clears throat> we have uh, uh, the entrance for Rotary Park. We need to go right through the parking lot and the entrance to the park. Um, we anticipate that pr would take about 10 days to get through there. So we've incentivized him to be com for the contractor to be completed within that, that time frame. And then uh, probably the most critical time frame of the project is the Paisley Park entrance. Uh, the, sewer, the sewer line goes right through the area where we, you go under the railroad and come up and go into the park. And the baseball season starts there uh, May the 7th, and that's the Teener League, and there's no other place to play. So we need to be done with the entrance so that we can get public in and out of there by May the 1st. So we've incentivized the contractor, uh, again, $1,000 a day to be completed uh, on or before May 1st. Yes? They get $1,000. If they're over, they, get, they have to pay $1,000. Correct. So that, that's a really critical, critical area we've met with uh, the, the uh, Baseball Association to, and uh, just to inform them of, of the status and what we're looking at there. Uh, again, a similar type of schedule uh, for this project. We have the same completion dates for the project, uh, anticipating bidding it next month. Um, again, the critical date of completing it through at the Paisley Park entrance by May the 1st, uh, Rotary Park. This is an anticipated schedule due to how fast they move that they would be done with that by July 15th. The pipe would be pretty much completed and operational by August 15th, allowing then about six weeks for final restoration, bike path uh, 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 work, and then uh, just final seating and, and final completion of the project. We have a, pro uh, a public information schedule for next Wednesday, the 26th at Morningside, to talk about more about the bike, bike trail impacts and uh, some of the parks impacts, and we're doing that in conjunction with the parks. That concludes my portion, and next will be Steve Burian to talk about the rates. Thank you, Dan. Council Chair Jamison, members of the council. My name is Steve Burian with AE2S. I have been working with your water reclamation utility since 2006 on various rate type impacts. In fact, when I walked into the facility today, one of the mayor's staff said, same presentation, different day, huh? And so I guess I don't know if that's a positive familiarity or a negative familiarity, but that was the greeting I received. What I've been asked to do today is to start with our June of 2010 presentation as a baseline, consider the different improvements that have been proposed to either be accelerated or, or added to your capital improvements plan to address the sanitary sewer um, mitigation efforts due to last year's failure, and then show you the, the various rate impacts and recommend a strategy moving forward. In front of you here is a table that we just tried to use as a reconciliation effort, and it's, again, as a ba from a baseline of the presentation that I gave to you in June of 2010. You can see that actually the majority of the projects that were included in the updated model were accelerated projects, $47.2 million of projects that were already envisioned in the capital improvements plan, but they were moved forward more aggressively to address the mitigation, those being the Central Main Interceptor and the South Sioux River South Interceptor at 21.2 and $26 million. Um, also in the final column there, if you're curious, the SRF stands for the State Revolving Fund. That's a low interest fund um, used in the state of South Dakota and across the country. Most of the projects you can see here were planned to be debted to take advantage of that low interest rate money. There is one that was going to be funded with cash on uh, the Western Interceptor Relief. For all of those projects were added, you can see that all of them but two were liner projects where they were going in and trying to rehab the interior of the sanitary sewer across the community. There was one upsize project, the Southeastern, Southeastern Avenue RCP, and then just for reconciliation purposes of the various small projects, less than a million dollars, total 2.2 million. 
So of everything I'm showing you today, the majority was accelerated where we've been previously planned, but there is $18.5 million of new projects that we've included in the capital improvements program. The graphic before you now is the graphic that we've worked together with the city to try to demonstrate the range of information we use for your different water and, and water reclamation sewer studies. It has time on the, on the horizontal axis and then dollars on the left vertical axis and then percentage increases on the right vertical axis. There's a lot of information here. The lowest line is the objective that you set for your operating reserve and then the green bar is your operating reserve. So if the green bar tucks up against that first line, you can see we've met our operating reserve. The second line up then is the sum of the capital reserve that we're recommending along with your operating reserve. And if the sum of the green and the red then either tuck up or exceed that second line, we've met both of our reserves. If we fall below the red line, at that point we're not meeting the objectives we set. The other line that's on there then is the residential rate increase and you can see we're coming off some very significant rate increases in 9 and 10 and we're at the point where we were looking at inflationary increases for a series of years after which with some of the improvements that were planned in the out years we had a bump to something close to, to maybe double inflationary increases in the outer years of the planning horizon. What we did, did to tackle this project is we, we took all of the new capital and projects that were either added or accelerated and updated the model from two, June of 2010 to try to determine what the impact on the rates would be of adding these mitigation projects. And there were a range of scenarios and I'm presenting th the three best to you or the, the three most applicable this afternoon. The first two use a standard in increase strategy where we would wait till January of 2012 to raise the rates. One where we try to meet all of our targets in one year, so it's obviously the most aggressive. And one where we, we mute those increases a little bit, but then have to suffer some consequences in terms of not meeting that sum of the capital and operating reserve. The last strategy is one that's a little bit more unorthodox, where we would recommend to you that you actually raise your rates in July of 2011, have a supplemental increase in July of this year, in an effort to try to have a smaller increase and take advantage of the time that that provides. And so what I'd like to do is go through those three different scenarios using the same type of graphic that I just presented, remembering that we're, st we're striving to meet both of those re reserve targets whenever we can. We want to look at the required rate increases then so that we understand the impacts. And then we were through, um, I don't know, just some type of maybe somewhat subjective, we did try to keep the annual rate increase for the residences below 10% as we went through this analysis. It was a target that we tried to establish. So avoid double digit rate increases. So the first graphic that I have here is, is a repetition of the previous one. So you can see the 18 and the 16 coming off in 9 and 10 and the recommendation that we made to you and you accepted of a 3% rate increase in 11. But what differs now is in order to in infuse these new mitigation projects and to meet or essentially meet our, all of our cash reserve targets, we would have to have a 19% rate increase in, at the beginning of 2012. From that then we'd, we'd go down to a 5% and then a series of probably sub-inflationary and then you can see there's that same bump in the outer years but if you compare slide to slide, the bump in the outer years with that big 19% increase is actually a little bit smaller with this strategy. This would obviously be the most aggressive strategy in terms of rate increases. The next graphic we have is an attempt to spread that out a little bit and so instead of jumping to the 12% or to the 19% increase in 2012, we considered two 12% increases over the span of 12 and 13. You can see the resulting impact on cash where it gets very lean in 2012. Where we're only meeting about half of our capital reserve objective as a result of this. And if you look back, you can see this is a utility that's been pretty flush with capital reserve over the years. With those two 12% increases, the shape of the remainder of the curve looks very similar to a 19% increase. And so we really essentially lose the benefit of the additional money that we bring in in 12 as a result of a more aggressive increase in 12. The third strategy that I present to you is one where we would look, and that's where the, the yellow box is so important, we would take the 3% increase that we've already recommended and you've accepted for 2011 and we would, would implement a supplementary increase on July 1st of 2012 of 5%. And we, looked, we did look, and I'll explain in a minute, but we looked at a 5% across the board increase. One of the other things we talk about quite a bit with you annually is cost of service, where we're trying to maintain equitability between user classes. For this particular effort, because 
it's hard to understand the budgeting impacts of this. Rather than looking at cost of service based increases, we looked at increases that would be applied uniformly across all applicable user classes. With an 8% increase and, and with the idea of trying to remain below 10, we looked at a 9.5% increase in 12. You can see we ver got very close to meeting our cash objective as a result of that strategy. We would then need a 7% increase in the, right now as it appears in 2013, after which we'd get to kind of a flat line moving forward of, of inflationary increase with a little bit of bump projected for 2017. After working closely with your staff on the various strategies and, and, and our perspective on different things, it would be our recommendation as we turn to the next slide that you implement a supplemental rate increase on July 1st of 2011 of 5% across the board for all of your user classes that are applicable to try to avoid any type of major double digit increases down the road. You can see then that what we're just showing is the, the user classes here that you have control over in the table and, and showing whether it's a meter perspective, that's the basic rate, or the flow where it's charged as a commodity basis per 100 cubic feet, that we would look at a 5% increase across the board. And then you can see that the, the resulting dollar amounts that you approved for 2011 with the 3% increase, and if we made the adjustment to 2000, in July of 2001 of 5%, what the resulting rate would be for each of those applicable rate customers and their applicable subclasses. I think it's also just for, for full disclosure, you have some uh, two other basic categories of rates in the community that we're not recommending an increase for. The first is the strength-based ones for the industrial, where you, you're actually measuring the amount of either um, um, biochemical oxygen demand or, or strength that comes in or the solids that come in or nitrogen or grease, and then you're, you're looking at that and charging on that because that's more of a, of a cost of service based element. We didn't recommend an increase as part of this strategy for that. And then for the, the four um, consecutive discharges that you have into the community, all of those are on contracts where you either can, you can only increase their rates either annually or every other year. And so as a result, we didn't recommend any, or couldn't recommend any increases to them at this time. They would have to be accounted for in, on July 1st of 2012. If you were to accept the increase that we put in place, um, this is a, a graphic that we present to you each year. It's actually better this time than typical. What we do each year for the benefit of all of our clients across the north central part of the United States is we do a survey of all the rates in 2011. We then work with you like in June on a 2012 increase. So we're always superimposing 12 over 11 and so I have to apologize for that. In this case, we scurried, if that's a fair word, to contact some of the clients across the region or, or, or communities across the region and get their rates that they implemented as of January 1. And so what you're seeing here is the information that's hot off the press. And what it shows that with your, your increase that you implemented on Jan 1, you were about in the quartile to the, to the third um, portion of this graphic at $20.65 if you implement the increase for a residential customer it would increase their cost about a dollar a month for somebody that uses water at a rate of about 5,000 gallons a month. And you can see that you'd only take, overtake one community in the region and really be at about the same spot you are competitively across the region. One thing I'll also draw to your attention as this graphic becomes more familiar to you, if, you, if, if we haven't tracked things, you'll notice there's the black and the green. The overall bar demonstrates the rate that somebody would have to pay if they use water at a rate of 5,310 gallons. The dark part, though, is, is would be a fixed rate. And so you can see some communities across the region, like St. Cloud, have no fixed charge at the top of the graphic. Others, such as um, Alexandria, Watertown, um, Spearfish, Fargo, um, Litchfield, charge only a fixed rate. And so no matter how much water you use, small or big, you're getting charged a constant rate across the your wastewater utility. And you can see for Sioux Falls, what you really have is a, a very small fixed rate, and then you have a, a volumetric covers the rest of your costs. And I think Sioux Falls is proud of that strategy because what essentially it indicates is that you pay for what you use in the community and not just a fixed rate to try to maintain revenue stability. The other thing that you've grown accustomed to is, is what is the bottom line for this? And so if somebody, an on average user, and this is why we chose this number, an average user in Sioux Falls at 5,310 gallons, or as you feel more familiar, look at it, 7.100 cubic feet, they would, have, they would have been paying $20.65 through June. 
If you accept the July increase recommendation, that would increase the $1.06 to a final rate of $21.71. With that, I appreciate the opportunity to present. I think Mark wanted to summarize things, and then I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Steve. City Council Mark Cotter with the Office of Public Works. It is just a couple points in summary. After the August event, we did take a quick look and assemble a team, develop the goals, not only leverage our own team members, but really look who are the regional experts that can help us make a very good comprehensive assessment of our system. To meet our goals, um, we have to, the, to date, evaluate the condition and the capacity of the trunk sewers. Those are the, those are the real arteries that move the wastewater through and across the city. We've come up with the prioritized list of projects based on those different criteria that Don highlighted. Focused more tonight on structural, since we did have a structural failure, and then also with Steve Burian's help, as you've seen him before, in our annual rate analysis is to see what is the rate impact to our customers, and so. From our standpoint, we know it's, um, we've got a lot more work to do because now that we have our flow meters in place, now we'll be able to start going up into those basins and continue to evaluate. But truly, the trunk sewer system is the lifeblood of the system and has to be uh, intact to make sure that we can stave off issues that have come up last year. So with that, we're all here. If you have questions, we'll do our best to answer your questions. There's no action tonight, obviously, it's informational, but we do think it is responsible um, as we look at the projects and the condition of those sewers that there is a strong need to accelerate the projects and there also is, um, to the rate of our customers, there's a, um, our initial approach is have a softer approach in rates as opposed to a significant impact in January 1 of 12. So with that. Any questions, questions. for Mark or his team? Councillor Litz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, say, Mark, I was uh, looking at the maps and uh, I noticed that uh, uh, the chunk that was between Louise Avenue and Cliff Avenue heading eastward, I believe, to the lift station, there's about a three-mile chunk there that's not the oldest piece that we had in there, but uh, apparently the structural quality of that is, is, really, uh, is really taking a turn for the worse. Is there any determination as to why that particular chunk is, is like that? I know it's a, it's a low... You know, it's a, it's a real flat area in there, but uh, has there been anything, you've been able to find anything out about that? I think just in general, Councillor, what we're finding is that the liners that were in those concrete pipes, because those are concrete pipes in that area, and then they're either a field-applied liner that protects that concrete from the sewer gas, um, or it's applied at the factory. It's just failed, and so naturally then it is it will start to eat away at that pipe. So um, in some cases, a pipe can... If there's, if there's very little corrosive activity inside a pipe, even if it's a concrete pipe, it can last for a long period of time. In some areas, we're just finding that the sewer gases are very corrosive. Um, it's accelerating uh, the degradation. Very good. Uh, so the rate increases, you know, I was on this council here a couple of years ago and when uh, Mr. Burian came down and uh, we, we, what we did at that time, this is, this is just kind of for the council here, uh, we decided over a five-year period we were going to raise our rates uh, the, on the sewer and the water and a number of other things to get uh, to get our, uh, our our costs in line with uh, what we take in, and it was it was controversial. And uh, you know, when I got on this council, the one thing I heard from a lot of people is you guys need to run this government more like a business. And uh, you know, this summer I heard loud and clear that uh, you guys need to fix those sewers. And, uh, you know, if you put those two together, uh, unfortunately, I think the rate increase uh, is as small as I think it is, and I'll be paying it as, like everybody else will. That's the way we do it. And I'd like to remind this council that we just borrowed, what was it, $24 million from the, uh, you know, from a, a fund that is, is for these type of things, and, and we've got to pay it back. So uh, I don't know if I'm going to be on here. We'll have to vote on this eventually, won't we? We will. I believe we will. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll be here or not, but good luck, councilors. Uh, Councilor Rolfing. Mark and, and the crew out there, um, we, g we gave you a directive, I think, uh, about two or three weeks after we had a near disaster up on North Cliff. And uh, the, the clear directive was, let's make sure, if we possibly can, that this never happens. And uh, I think it came from the mayor and it came from us uh, very clearly. 
and we said, um, please come back with something as quickly as you can that says what do we need to fix and how do we need to fix it and how can we pay for it. And I, for one, say thank you very much. I think you've done a great job here and uh, it tells us how we're going to pay for it, what needs to be fixed to get it started, and how soon we can get it done. So thank you very much. A job well done. You're welcome. Councillor Anderson. Mark, just a few basic questions. Um, could you just explain the different types of sewer pipes that we have within the city and the reasons why that we have those type of pipes? Sure, I may, um, just so I don't leave something out, I'll have Dawn step up here and she can take you through um, the different types and anyone for that matter. Dan Graber's currently been specking several pipe types for us and we'll start with Dawn and then we'll expand as we need. The city has used, um, you know, different types of pipe way back. Vetrified clay pipe, VCP pipe, has been used in a lot of the smaller um, down, up and down a lot of the arterial streets. Um, some of the trunk sewers, it's always been this reinforced concrete pipe, RCP pipe, that, um, and then we started lining that over the years. Uh, the PVC pipe, the polyvinyl chloride pipe. Um, that's typically used for water main is also out there, um, but um, it's you know typically used for more of a pressure system. But that's also a very non-corrosive um, pipe material, and you can see that um, when we looked at structural condition, the the pipes that came back, and you know really the first part of the assessment, we only looked at reinforced concrete pipe because we know what's happening out in the system with the corrosion in those pipes. Um, the, the city has been putting in what's called a Hobos pipe. It's a, it's a fiberglass reinforced plastic pipe um, since the 1980s. And that is something that um, a lot of communities, larger communities, are putting in for their trunk sewer pipes. Non-corrosive is not getting um, the corrosion rates that the RCP pipe has been seeing. And Mark, have I missed any? So those are the different types of pipe materials that the city has. Okay, thank you. Um, next question would be, uh, Mark, this is probably going to be one for you. The number of camera trucks that we have and how are they utilized as far as looking at older sewer lines or, okay. <laughs> Turn that over to operations with Trent. Um, we, have, we have three television vans. Two of them are uh, um, acided to sanitary sewer and one of them is acided to uh, uh, storm drainage and uh, we move those around as needs um, dictate. Uh, we spend a good deal of time doing uh, warranty inspection when new sewer is put in uh, uh, within two years you have to go through to see if there are any defects to make sure that if there are the contractor or whoever installed them will fix them. Uh, the other uh, part of our televising program is overlay. Uh, whenever we're going to go over, um, do overlay in a neighborhood, if the street needs to be tore up to replace sanitary sewer or, or uh, repair needs to be made, we do that. And then the other one is assessment. Uh, it will take us about, uh, with the 800 uh, plus miles of system that we have, based on our other tasks that we have, it will take us in excess of 12 to 15 years um, to get through the entire system uh, with the camera, based on the amount of uh, uh, available staff and cameras that we have now. So. And last question would be, um, before we um, are looking at replacing all this sewer line and piping that we're doing now, what was about the average number of miles of pipeline we were replacing every year? Mark is telling me five. Uh, it, a lot of it depends, especially uh, liner, that type of thing. Depending on cost, depending on bids, we usually uh, uh, would designate in excess of uh, possibly with a contract. So if we were going to line $400,000 worth of work in a given year, if the bids were favorable, we could do more work. Uh, in that year than uh, uh, the previous year, depending on bids. So uh, it's, it, it is variable to some extent, uh, um, and projects-wise, uh, about five. Uh, and that's pretty much what our goal is per year then, or in the replacement program? With, with the new replacement program? Yes. Uh, no, it would be in excess of that. Uh, the, the central main system alone is, is in excess of 15,000 feet. Uh, that we're going to do in 2011. I believe Sea River South is uh, one, the first segment is 8,000 feet, is around 8,000 feet. So uh, we would definitely uh, take a more aggressive posture. And then we're also replacing uh, more, um, uh, more quantity and larger pipe. So they're bigger projects. Thank you. 
Councilor Erpenbach. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to be a little bit parochial and talk a little bit about the Central District. If I'm going to be asked to vote for and justify, 5% is a pretty significant increase. You know, I, I, granted it's not 19% and I appreciate that. But I'm going to have to justify that to the Pam Road people who live just down the street from me and to the 30th and Phillips people who are not on any of the maps that I'm seeing for new construction. And Dan talked a little bit about those areas in the um, dynamic hydraulic model, but I'm not sure I'm seeing, there's nothing on paper right now that's a solution for those folks. Is that right, or am I missing part of the? No, that's, um, we can clarify that. Good. That entire Pam Road area does drain into the Sioux River South, which is where Mark's pointing to, okay. and then ultimately flows to the Tuthill lift station and gets um, pumped out to the treatment system. So this is Pam Road's trunk sewer system that we are replacing. One of the key factors, and um, Dan can add to this, is the sewer pipe that travels by Pam Road does tie into the central main near 26th Street, and our upsizing of that will greatly impact how that sewer flows. So we've got two different... Um, We've, you know, we're modeling different solutions, but we certainly want to reduce any future impact on that neighborhood. It's, it certainly has happened in the past, um, but we're very conscious of that neighborhood, and this is really, it truly is for the central district. It's for the core part of the city. I appreciate that, and I think that's important for folks to understand is that even though their particular street, their exact pipe is mm -hmm. not on the map, they need to understand that it's not necessarily that specific pipe, but it's something down the line that, that they're going to help pay for that's going to help solve that problem. Would you talk then also about 30th and Phillips? Does that feed into that same trunk line, or does that feed somewhere else, Mark? Let me have uh, Dan assist with that modeling discussion. Yeah, the, the, one of the Tier 2 projects, the Sewer River South, there's a connection across at 41st and Duluth. We call it a relief sewer that will relieve the, the area along Pam Road. The area up in 30th and Phillips, we're still looking at that to look at what are some of the alternatives in there to, to minimize those backups. So as of right now, there is no specific um, selected alternative for addressing that, but we're, we're working with the modeling like to get some flow monitoring up in up in that because that that flow from 30th goes west and it comes down Duluth Avenue and then it connects in there around 41st and Duluth so that's one of the ongoing projects we're trying to continue to evaluate with the modeling but the Pam there is a relief included in the tier one the Sioux River South for relieving that Pam Road area okay for Pam Road for sure in tier one and tier the, two in tier two tier two okay yeah. good good great thank you Councilor Litz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to remind uh, Councilor Erpenbach that, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago when we had the backups in the central part of town, we put $40 million into sewage, and uh, that benefited that area, and there was no special assessments to those properties from that. It was just paid for out of the general CIP dollars. So, uh, you know, in that regard there, the central part of Sioux Falls has had some attention in recent times. No, and I appreciate that, Councilor Litz, because that's exactly right. And I can talk about that all I want to and as much as I want to. But for the person whose basement is three feet deep in ick, that doesn't work for them. And so those are the folks that are the most vocal at this point, And the ones that are hurt the most at this point is this next section. And so it's just it's just part of the conversation that we have to have with these folks that it's coming. You know, I, it is part of the plan. I understand that, but I would also add that probably without these two things that we're talking about here today and the part that we put in seven or eight years ago, they would still would be in. They wouldn't have any alternatives at all. So. Yep. No, that's exactly right, and I appreciate that. Councilor Aguilar. Mark, what will the process be from this point forward as far as rate increases? <laughs> I think right now what um, tonight is just informational, but. We think that it's, we would like to get through our budget process for 2012 for this utility, and we think it probably makes the most sense to pull this one out of the group of annualized rate reviews for not only the significance and the uniqueness of a mid-year rate increase, but likely by late March or early April, we would come back with a proposed uh, ordinance to do a mid-year rate increase. And then behind that, we would give you a a schedule of those projects, just like what we've done with the Central Main. This segment here that travels from Tuthill Lift Station back to the west, um, 
we need to go through the process with the DENR with SRF funding, and so we can give you much more um, project time frames, funding time frames, and in that matter. But at a minimum, that would get designed in 2011. So we are ready to go um, in 2012 <coughs> with construction. One of the comments that um, the mayor had asked me to also add, and, and it's important because they, um, we talked to we talked to the local contracting community on sequencing these types of projects, on on also breaking them up because we've got some very good large local underground contractors that have bid segments of the central main in the past. Um, and would we certainly expect them to as well? One of the one of the ways that we're also going to do that is we're going to split the bid for segment five and segment six on different days. So um, one will be bid one week, the other will be bid the next week. So we don't bid them all on the same day, and you either get all or nothing per se. So anyway, we've we've certainly looked at that from a um, local contracting standpoint as well. Um, certainly encouraging the local contractors. Obviously, everyone here that's been a hired um, expert is also has either done work in Sioux Falls or has a as an office here. So we've engaged local professionals, and we certainly hope that local contractors, um, when we get into the bid <coughs> environment, will keep you posted on how those bid outcomes are. So at this point, I would not expect any further action until late March, early April. Thank you. Any other questions for Mark and his team? Mark, I've got a couple if I could. Oh. Okay. Uh, first off, uh, as uh, Councilor Rolfing alluded to, you guys have done a great job of stepping up, giving us the information we've asked for. So thank you, Trent, and all your team here. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's exactly what we're looking for, I think. Yeah. Uh, maybe a couple of other pieces of information if we could. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it piggybacks with Councilor Anderson talking about a kind of like a budget planning forward. And I'm not sure if this page here has it, if that's what you're referring to, but I would suspect that as that map and those colors change and the age of these systems, as, as uh, Dawn, I think, alluded to in 2025, we would have a nice looking map. The idea would be to budget out those 15 years and to know what we're going to be and should be spending every year. and how many miles we would, or blocks we would be picking up in new sewer. I would suspect that we'd need to borrow money again, probably in those, in those years, and then, you know, that's probably going to affect the rate, of course, that we'll have to increase to compensate for. And, and as well, some of those loans that have been borrowed in the past should be getting paid off, and mm -hmm. when that might occur, and our total debt load, and mm -hmm. all those things. But just a, maybe a budget, uh, for the next 15 years. So, so we know that there's going to be 30 blocks replaced on the next year. That's going to cost approximately. Mm -hmm. And we could expect uh, this kind of action every year for the next 15 years. Something like that would be, I think, helpful for us. Uh, and on the first page, one of the when you had the colors, is there any relation to miles or blocks that you can give to those? <clears throat> you know that we've got do we have a Which mile or 10 it? miles in, in dire straits, or do we have? I'm not sure which map to use, but just trying to quantify those distances. I know right. the color, and you can see the map, but is there any way to quantify those distances for us? Absolutely. All these are their GIS layers, so we can list their um, links. I think the key here is that. Um, you know, there there can be an eight-inch main that will be in a residential area that could easily be there for 75 years. Oh. But these are the backbone sewer systems, and, you know, there's a different way to look at it, too. It's almost inch diameter per mile. These are large diameter sewer mains that, that serve a large area of the city. It's like um, reconstructing Minnesota Avenue. You do it, you know, hopefully not more than every 50 years, and... So it's a little bit, even though we say we've got approximately 800 miles of sewer, if we were just to list these links, you know, um, only a portion of that is really the trunk sewer system. So um, we can certainly do that if that's helpful, but it does, 
it ranges in size all the way up to 66 inch diameter down to a six inch main in Sioux Falls. Um, but if that would be helpful, we certainly can. Well, I was just trying to quantify it myself, looking at the map, trying to figure out. And I think in the uh, proposals you show that there's mm -hmm. uh, 8,500 square, 8,500 feet of pipe that's going to be replaced for one project and the other project. That's good. Right. Uh, I was just trying to get a glimpse of the city and understanding uh, how much of it is in okay and how much of it is in needs help and how much of it is needs attention right away, that kind of stuff. But, right. Uh, one other question was, uh, uh, no, just reiterate to me, if you could, the no rate increases for those other communities and or the uh, industrial, why is that? Well, we have contracts that allows us to raise their rates annually. And so okay. essentially they will have a correction on January 1 of 2012. And so... Um, we do feel like since we do have contracts and, and it does state in their annual rate adjustments, Brandon, for example, is every other year that we would certainly honor that. But become the time we do the cost of service model that recommends rate adjustments for January 1 of 2012, they will be higher um, because they would have not had this mid-year rate increase. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think, too, if I can just add to your mm -hmm. comment on budget... I know we've talked a lot about a five-year capital plan, but just the size and scope of these utilities, water, wastewater, and landfill, we, whether it's a creation of a master plan that's looked out from a plant and build-out needs or sewer, that's why when Trent had mentioned this Sioux River South was identified in that 10-year that horizon, but we want to accelerate it um, just based on its condition, we can show you that because we do um, just to make sure long term. That's why you normally, when you see these rate models, you'll see that there's much more than five years that's in the review. It's because we've got projects that are planned um, out that far. So we can certainly uh, share more. We can show you our working spreadsheet of projects that we have out there that far. And again, that doesn't only account for, because we're still a growing city, that doesn't only account for replacement and rehabilitation. It also addresses every new house. You know, I think there was almost 350 homes that were built in 2010. Every new house that comes on the system is more wastewater flow. So we, we have to balance both sides, which is um, re rehabilitating our existing system, but also planning and managing growth. One other, one other item was the uh, cash reserves that you were trying to keep a target uh, balance of what is that amount again cash reserves our operating reserve is basically a 90-day reserve and that that varies based on the year and so we want at least one quarter of the year to always be in the bank and then the capital the red That's our target the there is we look out long term 10 years and quantify the amount of capital improvements that we're going to <laughs> that we're going to invest and we take 15% of that, and that's our target there. Part of that is just to operate the cash in the fund. So we always have cash to do work throughout the year, um, but also just to have some responsible reserve levels. So those are our two. 90 days of operating is the green, and um, the red is 15% of our typical capital plan. So when, like when we borrowed the, uh, just bonded here for the $28 million, uh, we're always going to borrow the money, right? We're never going to have enough cash saved up to pay for some of these improvements. We'll never bulk up that much, right? Well, I think our intent, and um, certainly before this last summer, our intent was to start to reduce the debt of this fund because, you know, we want to get to a point where, Projects that philosophically are 2.5 million and less, we want to do those with cash. Okay. Um, something that's greater than 2.5, we feel like with the um, the low interest debt dollars that the DNR provides at 2.25 percent, terms are 10 years, are very good for our users. A lot of Don had mentioned most of these pipes last for 50 years, so it's appropriate to spread those costs out over a longer period of time. Um, but for the majority, this, this utility is very healthy. 
and we did do a debt test um, last year on this utility and you know we'll be as aggressive as we can to build as many projects with cash as we can going forward um, to stave off our debt ceiling okay very good councilor say it from by <laughs> thank you <laughs> question maybe this is for the city clerk this is this particular PDF is not or um, the PowerPoint is not online at this point can it be loaded so that it goes with this agenda so that folks can look at it more closely actually thank you for the question as I had just asked that to Jamie earlier oh uh, we always would like and prefer if we can get those documents ahead of time for those who are watching uh, uh, web streaming our meetings uh, could have those documents to open and look at during the meeting if that is if it's not given to us of course state law now requires you to have copies in the audience and I think mr. Cotter and his department did do that but in terms of we don't get those ahead of time we try to get that information from the department and then load it upload it it'll be after the meeting and so it's too late for those who are watching but that's kind of how we remedy that uh, internally well I was thinking well, maybe it should be linked to the public works page but the more I look at it the more it really needs the commentary to go with it it really needs to be with that agenda so thank you I appreciate that so well, and if I could just there are this recent changes to state law uh, a year ago uh, if something is on the agenda all those items that are handed out that are a part of that discussion must be available to the public and so that's kind of what we look to try to provide for those who are watching at home thank you anybody else seeing none again mark uh, I just got to say you know as this counselor uh, you guys did a great job I know we were pressing you for a lot of information you you guys and your team really came through and mayor you've got a good staff here uh, uh, we appreciate this is a serious function for our city out of sight out of mind is, is one thing but you know uh, you guys have stepped forward and did a good job thank you thank you I too I can't say enough about our team and the experts um, just like with the sewer clap seems like whenever we needed somebody they answered on the first call so thank you to the team all right thank you all right we'll move on to our next presentation it's the uh, 2010 noise ordinance revision outcomes from Jill Franken welcome Jill Good afternoon, Jill Franken with Sioux Falls Health Department. Luann Ford and I are here today to share with you uh, uh, some outcomes that we've achieved as a result of the revisions that we made to the noise ordinance um, uh, within this last year. Uh, just to take you back just a little bit, at the uh, end of the summer in 2009, we, um, when we were evaluating our noise permitting, we started, well, it was pretty obvious throughout the summer that we were starting to have an uptick in some of the issues and the complexity of, of the issues related to our noise ordinance were starting to um, need some attention. And as we do with most of our um, concerns that start coming forward, we take a look at that, we do an assessment, we evaluate what are all the variables, what are all the factors included in that. We then um, look at our current process and say what kinds of changes do we need to make and then we um, draft those, we run them by everybody that's involved and then we test them out and we um, revise as needed, run those test changes out and then um, develop a new process. So that's what we indeed did this time as well. Um, we, when we started seeing these um, uptick in the number of complaints, the complexity, um, just the number of uh, requests for uh, noise permits in general, uh, we then started meeting with the stakeholders that were involved um, with that. And uh, we held several meetings, uh, in particular with downtown Sioux Falls. They were a really good partner in, in looking at this specifically because uh, many of the concerns were coming from that general area. We also uh, met and had meetings with the prior stakeholder or permit holders from prior events that had occurred around the city. And then we also met with the agencies or the departments, uh, the attorney's office, law enforcement, et cetera. Because not only did we have to look at the ordinance itself, we also needed to look at our own policies and procedures as it related to how do we um, assure uh, continuity and consistency in how we're um, dealing with 
uh, noise um, within the city. We, we only do a part of it. Um, law enforcement is very involved when uh, you look at during off hours and as the event's actually occurring that's permitted. Uh, if there's concerns that need to be addressed, they're the ones that come and are at the ready to deal with those. So we, um, we, we increased our, um, uh, as we looked at these, well, again, to the fourth point, under meeting with stakeholders and departments, we also provided outdoor demonstrations. Uh, that was one of the really, um, imp I thought it was a very valuable exercise for us, was to take people out uh, downtown. We actually did one downtown where we had a guitarist who had an amplifier, and we had him um, play at various levels of noise of sound, increasing that. And then one of our officers um, then measured that noise in various locations and shared those results with the people that were there from uh, uh, downtown Sioux Falls. And that was very helpful. Uh, we also did it from someone's um, uh, uh, apartment uh, downtown uh, so that we could tell what the, how the sound was and what the noise level was actually in the in the buildings themselves. So as we did this, we also looked at what are other communities doing, uh, how do they deal with this in their ordinance language, and we also looked at the EPA model noise ordinance as a guide as well. Uh, we had numerous meetings with uh, between police department, the attorney's office, and ourselves to um, look at what kinds of changes do we want to make, what would make the most sense in terms of moving forward with our current uh, reality. It's, it is a reality. People enjoy the downtown now more than ever in our community, and uh, not just downtown, but other areas as well. And uh, there's more and more requests for events that have music, things like that that are outside. And so we needed to respond to that. So we, uh, in addition to increasing our communication between police department and the health department, we also um, revised our application. Uh, we require um, information, design specifications for the event, et cetera. We also provided um, education um, to those uh, that are providing those or that are requesting the permits and making application as well as to the public. We held some things on Channel 16 and uh, also included some information on our website. And one of the things that we have not yet done but we hope to do in the future uh, as um, look at an online application process. That's one of the things that was identified that could be valuable that we have not yet uh, done. One of the things we'll uh, continue to do with that education process too is put those things, uh, the training and education that we've developed will um, come into play on an annual basis and not just as we made these changes initially. So we ended up 2009 with that assessment. We started into 2010 with these meetings and, and revising our policies and procedures and drafting some ordinance language. And what came about from that was uh, just an overview here of the changes that we implemented. Uh, there are, uh, we uh, made the recommendation to exempt private events that are in public parks that are less than one hour in duration. And that was about a third of the permits that we were getting uh, applications for were those types of events, a wedding perhaps, um, a little celebration of some sort, but usually um, it was about an hour or less an event. Um, and those, we did not receive complaints on those or concerns regarding those, and it was found that we could exempt those and, and our community would not be uh, worse off for that. Uh, we also, um, changed the way we permit sound downtown. Uh, they were able to come to an agreement as an entity on what they felt was acceptable, understanding that it's a mixed use area of town with residential and business. And the residential um, folks wanted to be able to um, come to a happy medium as well as the business um, owners did as well and they were able to do so and we made some changes accordingly with the um, time uh, constraints that noise could be um, a little bit louder and a little bit later um, and then the decibel level. We also did uh, um, quite a bit of changing the language so that it could be 
better measured um, if there was a concern um, using a peak system which would allow the police department if they got called to actually measure the sound a little bit better and that gets pretty scientific but we did make some changes um, as well with how they could actually measure the sound so it would be um, easier for them and uh, also easier for those who have um, noise meters. Uh, many uh, of the business owners actually have their own noise meters and they're able to monitor the event as it's ongoing. And so by uh, describing the peaks that they needed, that was helpful to them because it could be measured more easily with their meters. So that was one of the changes that was found to be very acceptable. We also Im included and added a uh, ability for citizens to participate in the process of of uh, identifying if a if a concern is um, is happening with something in their area if they are um, there were a couple ways that a compliant we added a what it was that we added was a compliance review um, process and we actually put that in ordinance and the compliance review would come into place if two or more notices of violation or citations were written. Um, of a particular entity um, that would cause a compliance review to be conducted by the health department. Also, if residents were concerned about the level of, level of noise activity and they wished to um, protest for any future sound permits, they could do so by um, developing a petition and bringing that forward. That would also, uh, will also initiate a compliance review. And uh, so um, though, those were some of the uh, basic overview of things that we changed. Um, I also will tell you that we changed the, the fees um, accordingly. And as you know, um, uh, those of you that have, uh, that I have heard me come before you, we have changed and, and adjusted our fee structure um, in several different areas of the health department. And this was one that we also changed. We didn't make large changes to the basic sound permit um, charge, but we did increase it um, slightly. And then we also changed to allow for the, uh, um, how much we charge for a particular application would be based on the level of workload um, that the inspector would actually be doing for that particular permitting. Um, so special events were, actually, were a higher cost and a higher fee than um, perhaps a simple basic sound permit. And uh, one of the things that we will do, um, before I turn it over to Luann, I just want to mention, because I anticipate it could be a question for you, is that um, we were, will evaluate now that 2010 is over and we made those changes, um, look at where our revenue came in, and uh, with the year completed, we'll, we'll evaluate all our permit revenue and see how much of that was applied to noise permitting and uh, see if our, what we had guesstimated um, before we made those changes actually came to fruition to cover the costs of doing permits for noise. So with that, I'll turn it over to Luann Ford, who will um, share the uh, last information we have for you. Good evening, I'm Luann Ford. I'm public health manager for the health department. As Jill said, we've had a pretty exciting year at uh, the health department as far as the noise ordinance goes because we had been having some problems uh, with people not always being totally happy with how the noise ordinance was, um, uh, not necessarily how the permitting process went, but how the noise was affecting neighborhoods. And so our goal was to try to find a way that we could work with our existing staff and accomplish uh, a, a better place for people to enjoy Sioux Falls without people who do not want to attend events uh, being disturbed. So as you look at the, the next slide, how has this changed, impacted Sioux Falls? Uh, as you can see, the permits that were issued in 2008, we had 208 permits, 2009, 287. So we had quite a jump. And that put some strain on, on our staff. So what do we do about that? Uh, as Jill mentioned, we did put a change into the ordinance that exempted the low impact events, the events that weren't making a lot of noise and the sound that they were making was not really leaving the property they were on, so they weren't disturbing their neighbors. And so we exempted those events, which then lowered our permits to 154 for 2010. 
Now the result of that exemption is the low impact events were tying up staff time that really didn't have a lot of purpose. And so now it allowed us more free time to focus on the events that did have a high impact. Um, we also started a, a special event permit specifically. So if uh, an event wanted to go later than a basic permit or louder than a basic permit, they had a separate permit application that they filled out and of course additional fee to cover the additional work that was going to be spent in, in reviewing it. What that permit process allowed us to do was identify the events that had the potential to have higher impact in the neighborhoods and then work with them a little closer. We would meet with them, talk with them, go over the layout of their event, uh, assess how their stage placement went, speaker placement went, and then we would do a sound check. And we did a sound check for every special event that was in Sioux Falls, and the uh, uh, event would have the sound check before they got started, so they knew where they were at, they knew how close to their permitted level they, they were. And then if we had concerns about that event, uh, because of its closeness to residential or, or the weather that was going to be going on that night that might adversely affect the way sound was traveling, then we stuck around and we did uh, some sound checks later on in the evening too so that we could see and communicate with the event organizers so that they knew where they were as far as um, uh, the sound. So. Um, what did all this mean? What did we do? So the end result, uh, in 2009, before we had the ordinance changes, the health department received 11 noise complaints on permitted events. And in 2010, after the ordinance change, no sound complaints from permitted events were received by the health department. So we feel pretty good about that. And our goal this coming year is to strive for that again. We already have a meeting set up with the police department to review sound meter placement and we intend on running the program uh, with communication and, and working with the event organizers just like we have last year. Do you have any questions? Any questions for Luann? <clears throat> Uh, Councilor Anderson. Just one statement. Um, this was an issue that I, I uh, worked a lot with the health department on, and uh, I've, I actually, in 09, I uh, received complaints from both sides, residents and business owners. And I think that uh, the health department and the police department have done a marvelous job uh, taking a look at this ordinance, working with the people who were involved in putting on programs and the, and the neighborhoods uh, to alleviate a lot of the concerns and complaints that were going on. So I just want to say thank you. Uh, I'm glad that you guys took a look at this and I think it's all for the better. Thank you. One other question, Luann or, or Jill, uh, when, and Kenny, maybe you answered it. Uh, the event holders, they're not complaining either that the rules are too stringent or anything like that. It's a good balance here. Uh, balance is exactly right. Uh, we did have, you know, I don't know that always everyone was completely 100% um, getting what they wanted, but they sure felt really good at, at the end. I, I think it truly is um, an educational process to help folks understand what impact they're having in the community when they hold events outside and they are um, you know amplifying that sound into not only the business areas but also into the residential and and that's the challenge we continue to have to deal with as new businesses are um, coming into our community as new managers of businesses are coming into the community it is a work in progress and we have to continually educate and remind folks because they want to have these they want to pull people in. They want to sell their their product to um, the community, and they want to make money. And we understand that. And uh, but we also have to do so. You know, we have to help them do it in a way that they can uh, be good neighbors. So great. great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Very good. All right. We'll. Uh we need to go into executive session, so I need some help here. If somebody would be willing to. Uh, uh, <coughs> I'll second that.
pen, pending litigate, litigation. Pardon, yeah, you need to state, you always need to state the reason why until it's on your, if, you, if one of you could just amend that, thank you. No. Very good. Motion made by Councilor Litz, seconded by Anderson to go into executive session.